not my first speaking, but somehow like I'm still super nervous when doing talks, so hopefully it won't uh, get in the way. But uh, before we of course talk, you know, I should show my credibility, so you can follow me here, and I'm going to talk a bit about me and why I'm talking about uh, these topics. So I started like uh, around 12 years ago working with Microsoft SQL Server 2008. So I'm kind of old, I guess. How many of you actually did data for like uh, 10 years? Okay, so some of you might actually feel me on this. Like, so I'm not alone. Uh, so you know, during back then, you know, what you usually do, you know, is you have uh, like one, your own SQL Server instance where you run you know, all your queries and you basically use all of the um, SQL uh, functionalities like indexes, constraints, uh, and these kind of things to actually ensure that your data which you produce, produce is uh, actually good and qualitative, right? Um, but now, you know, like uh, if someone is watching Avatar, right, the Fire Nation or like Hadoop Nation attacked and we have to switch uh, to use big data and we have to address, you know, all of the questions or like things that company asked us to do, you know, using big, that big data, right? So, yeah, this is this, and you can imagine me like this through all of this talk, because some of this is going to be rant, you know, like and me complaining, but when you actually think about it, it's going to be uh, how I already see some of the patterns uh, coming back through, uh, from the old days back now. So one of them is actually write audit publish. Uh, so, ETL or ETL. Uh, so for some of you who not know, you know, so ETL is basically you extract your data, you do transformations, and then you load it to source. And the good thing about it is if you would use, you know, some uh, RDBMS system, right, is uh, that you can actually use, you know, some of native functionality there to ensure that your data is quality. So you wouldn't mess anything downstream, and you wouldn't have any faulty data for someone to accidentally just stumble upon it and do, you know, jump to conclusions where they shouldn't, right? Uh, currently, you know, with big data, there was a switch in, in the approaches, and the, you can see, you know, the moving wave of people doing, you know, ELT, right? It's like DBT people. How many of you here are using DBT? I'm afraid to say. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Uh, what comes with DBT is actually, you know, you have like very good orchestration out of the box. You have like a lot of features there, you know, it has its own own space and own place, you know, in uh, all of the data engineering part, right? But uh, there are some things where it's lacking. And uh, so one of those is actually what I mentioned, the database constraints. It's missing in like, I think, majority of the cloud providers, if we're talking about cloud data warehouse providers. So usually, or to identify if you haven't worked with RDBMS. So we have four of them. And, uh, you know, I, I suck at tech, you know, we can imagine back a couple slides back, old man yelling at clouds. So this is my main display, so I'm seeing the same as you. I missed my speaker notes. So uh, we have entity. I'm going to do this. So we have the basic entity integrity, right? Primary keys, uniqueness, not nulls, and do whatnot. These are the common things which DBT checks after the, the things are done, right? When you already have your data in your table. Uh, then you have the domain integrity. So you have the check and default constraints. Also, I'm referencing a lot of NDBT because it's like very, very popular tool now, I guess. Uh, so you can check those as well. The foreign key for the referential integrity and the user-defined integrity index and stored procedures and triggers. So now, now I know what I'm gonna talk about because I didn't know how I put it into those four categories. Uh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to go smoother now. So uh, let's talk about the indexes and the uh, things that are coming back to life. Some of the open table formats already, you know, are cycling back to the old practices, right? We're missing like the lookups or like joins are super slow. It's not efficient. So we're seeing, you know, that the pattern, they're actually adding these things back then. We can already see, you know, that uh, like all of this is moving in the same, same way with write audit publish pipelines. So basically there are things how we can ensure, you know, that not to mess your tables or like information when you're actually producing that information to the production table. So currently 
why I mentioned DBD. So if you're using DBD, like I'm 95% sure that your pipelines actually look like this. Uh, if someone has something differently, so you're in th that those 5% that actually doing something more, you might have, of course, you know, more uh, Python code in between, but if you're using purely DBT, most likely it's something like this. You have some dependencies in your DBT, uh, like assets, or like, you know, your tables, views, whatever, right? And then you test them afterwards. Thing is, by using DBT, you're exposing your data already after the things were done, right? So if, for example, you know, you have like, you're in a bigger company, and uh, what happens, you know, that like you want to use other teams uh, produce dbt asset, right? Or like, you know, a table just to keep it simple. And uh, so you have two choices, right? Either to add it to the same DAG, so it would make it a bit more cluttery. It's hard to read, the dependencies, of course, it's nice and you can see, but you know, you wouldn't know when the data is refreshed or not. Uh, so yeah, you do dbt runs and then, you know, hope you know that nothing goes sideways, right? Because usually how it goes, it usually does. Uh, so problems with this, uh, problems with this. Uh, so like I mentioned, right, you're already releasing your data to potentially for people to access it and to actually, like I know, like I said, jump to conclusions. And this is the biggest problem with uh, like all of the approaches or like people what are doing now, right? They're hoping that, you know, their data will be correct and no one will use it without correct adding the rules, you know, or like ensuring that it's actually put correctly into production with all the constraints. So, who knows what's right or that published in general? <sighs> That's good that you came here. So, uh, basically it's a very simple pattern where you actually, before pushing your data to a, a production table, you actually ensure, you know, that it follows all of those rules and you're not exposing it. Right, so what basically you run, like the easiest or the simplest approach actually to use the current like state of uh, all of the cloud providers, what they produce, or like, you know, the table formats, some of them, is to, you know, push to different schema, different database, or, uh, you know, do something in memory, and only if those checks pass, only then you push or write your data to the actual database, right? So what this means? This means that actually, you know, if you're querying production, you're not gonna see like faulty values or like, you know, false values, and you're not gonna allow people to jump to conclusions where they shouldn't. So, uh, talking about potential solutions, so I guess we're gonna talk about three. So, the most, uh, I don't know, the most common, I guess, for people to actually implement it uh, is either DBT, uh, like, or any other uh, system tool, whatnot, or Pandas. So the first one and the easiest one is, of course, going to be, I'm going to talk about do it yourself on Pandas. So long story short, right, what you do, you're basically reading some data, uh, you're doing some magic with it, and uh, then you add actually some rule sets on it. So basically you're creating some kind of filters, you know, like checking your, uh, like, if the data conforms to your uh, expected outputs, right, and only if the data passes, you only then, you know, like can't push it to production or like start it somewhere. This, by the way, example uh, I've taken from, if I'm not mistaken, from Dexter. So you can also check this nice post. Uh, I was a bit inspired, but they covered only this piece there. So I'm a bit, uh, how to say, disappointed. But uh, let's talk about disappointment after my presentation. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but there are other ways, you know, how we can do it, you know, because previous approach, what it does with pandas uh, or like with uh, majority of the data frames, you're keeping it in memory. And if your checks fail, you know, you don't have any usually intermediate place where you can double check what went wrong, how it changed or what actually, what you can manually intervent or do with the data you already have. So you wouldn't need to trigger those calculations back again. And if you're using Pandas, you already, you know, have a severe case of performance issues. Mm -hmm. uh, another example is like, you know, uh, which comes out of the box is actually from Snowflake. And this is the, one of the best features, you know, actually when I saw it. Um, so basically what it does, like, I'm not affiliated with Snowflake, so first thing first. I'm not affiliated with Daxter with that link as well. 
uh, and your all views are my own. Yeah, I forgot that disclaimer. So Snowflake has this very neat feature where it actually, instead of copying the data, you can use, you know, the like their promoted zero copy clone. So it doesn't copy any of your contents of files, it just co copies the references on it. So if you manipulate something on those references, you're actually not changing the exist existing table information like on the production, right? So you have your copy, you run your things, you know, you can see what's happening, but up until, you know, like you override the production table, you won't see it happening. So in one of my previous companies, we actually had this kind of thing. So we're running, you know, our DBT stuff. Uh, we're testing and only when we ensure that our flows are correct, then we're doing, you know, magical zero copy clone of the whole database, you know, which is exposed to the end users. So what we win with this situation, one, if we have some issues with our main tables, or like the most important ones, none of the production, uh, like or the user facing information is uh, corrupted. We have everything inside properly, no issues there whatsoever. But we just don't have data for the day, you know, like it's better to have no data than faulty data for that one, one single day, right? Uh, and, and it's a very neat feature, but what it requires us to do, we have to maintain that custom piece of code, right? We have to create extension of the existing pipelines. We have to do a lot of manipulations, actually, uh, either to create a very well-maintained framework, which would actually allow us to do that, right? Or we have to, like, see how to make it simpler. Maybe, you know, at some point, you know, they're going to release some neat future feature. Though I have, I have a hunch that for Iceberg that's going to happen at some point later. But uh, yeah, so this is good. We can check what happened on the data. We know uh, what actually caused the issues. We can solve it. We can manually adjust it, you know, and then run tests and then make it pass. And then we can, you know, ensure that the data users are actually doing, they're doing correctly on the right, for the right reasons. Uh, and this is the one actually the most important for me. The, the most fun for me is uh, Apache Iceberg branches. How many of you knows what's Apache Iceberg? Okay, okay, so that's good. So a uh, very neat thing they did uh, last year, around like, like almost a year ago, like end of March last year, they released a neat feature called uh, branches. Like they implemented a lot of functionality. And uh, so I guess if you came here, you know, you most likely haven't heard or know uh, very little about branches. So I guess that's a victory for me, uh, making it a bit obscure my topic. Uh, so uh, what branches does, it's basically a git for your data. You can create your branch, you can actually run your flow. Like, uh, like so let's take an example of your Apache Spark code, right? So when you're running your code, you can uh, specify if you're using Iceberg that you want to have like a uh, write audit publish enabled. And then you can uh, add a flag or like enable a flag for your uh, like tables that you're going to override uh, to have that enabled as well. What it, what it does, it actually then has a copy of your data, similarly like with Snowflake, right? You don't, you don't have to add a lot of how to say complexity or things uh, like just to like tangle your code and like, make it more spaghetti meatballs kind of thing. Uh, it's and with like with Git, right? Everyone's using Git. Like I guess if you're not using, so I I'm sorry and I hope you you can use it at some point. Uh, but basically, it allows you to actually implement this thing in a very very neat way and a very familiar way if you're anyway doing some coding. So this is the I guess interesting part. So, what we do, like I said, you know, we enable some uh, table properties. We're enabling this. We're creating a very, very neat name, you know, for our branch, manual hotfix, because who doesn't uh, do production hotfixes in the morning? Uh, then we enable that our whole Spark flow is actually using that branch. And we can go crazy. We can delete stuff, you know, drop columns, you know, and do anything crazy. But up until we call the last function, when we're gonna actually, you know, fast forward our main branch to actually become the manual hotfix one, users will not see it. So how good is that? You can do a switcheroo, right, on your folks. You're just gonna delete the, the, the tables and then, you know, point them a query with uh, which points to a branch. And they're gonna say, you know, why there's no data? And you say, oops, sorry. 
and there's a neat feature of Iceberg that you can actually time travel or query snapshots. Uh, so that gives you another layer of security that if you mess something up, you can very quickly in a very sequelish way actually try time travel back or cherry pick a snapshot. So what I actually like about Apache Iceberg at this point is that it tries to give, give those data, data engineering or like in general software engineering principles, not only you know, like you're used to on your code, but also tries to do that you know, for your data pipelines. And this is why I actually start to love this tool more or like you know, table format more and more. Though, again, like I said, not all of the features and uh, I'm still gonna rant about it that you know, let's say the lookups or like the joints in general for all open table formats are still slow, right? Because it's, you know, we're working with big data and we're most likely aiming to have one big tables, you know, to have them read optimized because, you know, we're gonna write it once usually, right? And people gonna read it more. See, it didn't sleep. So uh, I jumped through all of the things so fast. So let's go to the reasons, you know, to write other publish or not. So actually, to, like I mentioned, there are a lot of pros to actually use, you know, write, audit, publish. Like one of the biggest ones, you know, people will trust your data uh, just because, you know, you won't have any production incidents, no bad decisions are going to be made. Uh, just because, you know, you mess something up, you know, in your code, right? So that's the biggest one, I guess, reason for all of the data engineers to actually try and implement this practice. Uh, because if you lose trust, or your, your stakeholders lose trust in data, you're basically, your job goes to waste. They're still gonna rely on that feeling. Uh, yeah, and uh, summarize again, humans are in the loop, something goes sideways, right? You can always go back, do manual adjustments if you want. You can adjust your code, check out the code again, and, uh, or check out the branch, adjust it again, and push it forward. And uh, Iceberg seems at this point that it has the less uh, overhead to actually for you to achieve it. And there are, of course, you know, the downside of it. Uh, if you like to uh, dabble, you know, if I like, do it yourself and have a lot of maintenance, so you can do it right away without like very much hustle, right? Do some ifs, uh, join your query uh, or like Pandas data frame uh, and test together in the same flow and only then goes, you know, then override it. So using staging temp tables or whatever can also give you this benefit. <coughs> And uh, like, you know, I guess if you counted the hands, who knows, write audit publish, I think I counted like less than six. Uh, so, you know, there's very little knowledge and people are actually not just using, just because they're not aware. So, right on time. Thank you very much.